to achieve this lofty, worthy goal is through the IUCN One Plan approach as endorsed by the Cell Law Working Group. What the One Plan is, uh, is articulated by IUCN and the Cell Law Working Group specifically for Cell Law. It's the pairing of uh, what often were separate projects in the past of conservation of habitat uh, and management of threats for an animal, animal in the wild with uh, a captive breeding program, which is essential to save some very critically endangered species like cell law, and pairing these into one plan, one integrated program. Um, so that's what's going to be done for cell law. And um, there have understandably been some doubts expressed lately about the cell law one plan approach, chiefly um, a belief that perhaps it's too late to save cell law. It's important to note that these doubts are just beliefs, not the conclusion of a rigorous collection and an analysis of data. Uh, Rob and Olay, and Olay, who you'll hear from today, has spent more time in the cell laws range than most people on the planet, and they believe differently. And they're also gonna explain how we intend to gather the data needed to form a firm, firm conclusion. But all of us involved in the Cell Law Foundation are here because we firmly believe it's not too late to save cell law. That said, we do have to act very quickly. So I just want to say a little bit about our two speakers. It's my delight to introduce both of them. I've known Rob since 1994, when we both washed up in Laos doing wildlife surveys. Um, we both actually started there earlier in 1992, but we didn't overlap in that year. Um, Rob was already making his mark by then. Um, in 1990, fresh from a undergraduate degree in zoology from Cambridge University, he went on a student expedi expedition to do some bird surveys uh, in the Philippines archipelago. And one place they were going to was Cebu, uh, which was home to an endemic, beautiful small bird, the Cebu flower pecker, which hadn't been seen for 60 years and was presumed extinct. Well, Rob showed his talent early. He looked at maps of Cebu and said, well, I'm not gonna believe that. If, these, if Cebu flower pecker still exists, it's probably in this patch of forest here. And this, you know, 22 year old kid went there and rediscovered Cebu flower pecker. And it was kind of amusing because uh, Rob is colorblind. He has trouble distinguishing red and green. And apparently there's something about red and green that um, confirms the, identify, the identification of Cebu flower pecker. And in his excitement, he actually had to go back to the camp and get somebody to come with him and tell him if it was actually red or green that this bird had. Um, so I'm gonna share my screen now, if I may, just to finish the introductions. All right, can you all see that? This is an historic photo that I took of Rob in about, I don't know, 1995, I think, in a little guest house in Lac Sao, which was the little town in central Laos where Martha, the captive cell law, showed up a year or two later. And Rob is skinning out the type specimen of a beautiful new species of rabbit um, that he found in a fresh food market. Um, so the Cebu flower pecker was quickly found. I mean, Rob just continued this um, demonstration of this talent for finding new or little known species. Um, once he washed up in Laos, he probably would have found discovered Sala. He just didn't get to Laos in time. But once there, he was, he's been significantly involved in the discovery of most of the, the larger new species discovered in the Anamites since Sala. Large antlered munchak, the Trungson or Anamite dark munchak, this entirely new mammalian family, Kanyu, um, Asia's only bald songbird, the bare-faced bulbul, and this uh, Anamite striped rabbit. Um, kind of as a testament to Rob's thoroughness, he published a description of the rabbit, but noted that he still needed to do further studies to you know, identify it and properly describe it as a species. Well, a couple of Russian biologists saw this paper and they said, well, hell, we'll describe it. So they ran down in Vietnam, they got a specimen and they gave the scientific name to the rabbit. But to their credit, they named it after its true discoverer, Rob. And this uh, species will be ever known as Nesolagus timinzi. Um, and you know, Rob is, you know, he's become 
so well known for this or demonstrated such a talent. I remember something that, um, oh, Indo-Chinese hog deer was another one. There's a, a rare, highly endangered subspecies of Asian deer, hog deer, Indochina that hadn't been seen for years. And in typical Rob fashion, uh, several years ago, he just looked at maps and Google Earth of Cambodia and said, well, this thing still exists. It's probably in this patch of habitat here. And sure enough, uh, staff from WCS and others went there and they uh, discovered Indo-Chinese hog deer. And there's now a, a, a vigorous conservation program for this deer. Our colleague, Will Duckworth, who is no slouch himself at studying wildlife, put it this way. Rob can go into a patch of forest in Indochina and absorb as much information or more in one day as I or the normal human being would take five days in this forest. So that's Rob Talents and we have him, um, you know, he's the best in the world at finding rare or little known species in Southeast Asia. And we're about to, we're supporting him to turn all his talent and effort to finding Salon Laos. And he's gonna to talk today about how he's, how we're gonna organize this and the effort he's gonna to lead to do this. Now a little bit about Olay. I've known Olay's father, Buntabi, about as long as I've known Rob, and Rob knows, has known him also. When I was coordinating the WCS Lao program in the mid-1990s, I hired Buntavi to be our driver, and he was such a great guy, and he loved being in the forest. We also made him our camp boss, and he would go on surveys with us and organize the camp. And we became, you know, we've been friends for more than 25 years, as well as colleagues. And about 2000, and I probably met Olay when he was a little kid. Um, and then in 2008, Buntavi called me up. I was working at a Nakayanam Tun National Protected Area in Laos at the time. And he said, oh, Bill, do you remember my son Olay? And I said, yeah, sort of. He said, well, he needs to do an undergraduate research project. Could he come to Nakayanam Tun and like look for Sawa with you? And you know, as a favor to Buntavi, I said, yeah, sure. I mean, of course I wouldn't turn that down. So this kind of wet behind the ears kid, here's Olay in 2008, showed up and he was fantastic. I mean, I just did a flyer, of course, I said yes to Buntavi, but Olay is incredible. Um, he loves the, I, he was in the forest for the first time in these field trips, and he just took to it like a fish with water, a fish to water. The other thing about him, um, this is, yeah, Olay setting a camera trap in the forest in 2008, a young undergraduate student. The other thing about him is he just, he has such rapport with villagers. Um, this is something that really marks Olay out as well. Um, he loves hanging out with the villagers and they love him. Um, this is drinking some uh, rice wine with the villagers after the survey. In fact, in this village, right in the Salaz range, um, the villagers started calling him, here he is with the village chief, the village headman. The villagers started calling him son-in-law which is a very affectionate nickname in Lao. Um, on their part, it was probably wishful thinking, you know, that he would marry one of their daughters, but it's a real sign of affection to be called son-in-law. Um, and they kind of just took him on as kind of an adopted uh, uh, member of their village. He also has fantastic relationships with the Lao government. So basically, Olay's got it all. He's fantastic in the field. And he's so good at the personal relationships of both the village and the government, which is so important. So with that, I am going to turn it over to Olay. We are just so grateful to have both of these guys working for the Cell Law Foundation on, on saving Cell Law. And I'm going to turn it over to them and let you uh, let them tell you what they've been up to. Olay, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Do you need some technical help? Yes, 
Is it already? It's my turn? Yes, go ahead. Okay, sorry. That's okay. Let me share the screen. Okay, here we are. Here you go. Can you see my screen? I can, yes. Okay. Um, firstly, um, thank you for introducing and telling story about me, Bill. Um, again, Ole Chantasuan Pumachan. Today's my talks will focus on why we are sure solar still exists what has been happening and the reason now for why we are so confident. This like, we will focus on what has been happening in Laos, where I have been closely involved in solar conservation since 2018. Um, sorry, in 2008, uh, Bill's mentioned about this. When I was an undergraduate student, and what we have learned that convinced us, solar is certainly not extinct. Most of you, I hope, knows what solar is. So I will give you just a quick introduction to some of the most important aspects to think about during our discussion today. Solar only found in the Andamite Mountains. That's for much of the border between Laos and um, Vietnam. See the picture showing in orange. Small range because of uniqueness of habitats. Solar never occur in extensively in Laos. For example, in the Mekong lowlands of western of Laos, most of Laos was once covered in dense tropical monsoon forests. The difference being this monsoon forest has a long dry season. One aspect I want to get you all familiar with is the size of areas we are talking about. For those of you in Yulo, equivalent to Finn Owls, or for Owls US listeners, the state of New Jersey. In the beginnings, most of what we learn came from indigenous community knowledge. Back in 1990, when I was a kid, many, many researchers right wrong were finding it easy to come across recent evidence of solar, most often as the remains of recently hunted solar. From this, a detailed picture of distribution of solar in the animals was built up and is very close affinities with wet evergreen forest established. But there are limitations to what we can learn from local indigenous knowledge. And so a variety of other methods have also been used. In late 1990, camera traps started to become commercially and easily available. In case you are not familiar, these are special designed automatic cameras that have been mechanisms to detect animals' movement and usually also body heat to trigger the taking of a photograph. The CNF trails or game cameras widely used in North America. 
you can set them off in the forest and leave them in place. And with the new models, this can often remain active for six months or more on one set of batteries. This has been the most widely used method to look for and learn about solar in the forest. And it is how we have the classic image of solar in the forest. See on the slide. But please note, camera tapping is not the best method to detect animal. Looking for special using DNA is a recent development. It's realized on finding a source of an animal DNA, taking a samples and then using molecular genetic techniques to see if there are any solar DNA present. For solar, it started with leeches. And I am sure you know leeches fit on the blood. But if you don't know, I am showing you an appropriate photos. May I apologize? Um, a leech feeds the butt at the knees of my college. And the butt has the DNA of the host in it. So techniques were developed to extract that DNA and find out what the leech has fit on. Then solar DNA has also been looked for in dung. Which researchers have either searched for directly or working with indigenous hunters. You can see these pictures. And lastly, solar DNA has been looked for in water, stream or pool in the forest. As you can imagine when an animal comes to drink or cross a stream, some of its DNA will be washed into water. That's a picture of me, myself, in the middle, sitting and using special equipment to filter DNA from stream water. What have we learned so far? Coaching in solar lens is a huge problem, especially by wise cable snake. It's not possible to survey anywhere in solar lens and not find evidence of snailing. And in the worst places, that's make up most, probably 70 to 90% of solar lens. You cannot go for more than a kilometer. It's approximately 0.75 of a mile without finding either columns or past evidence of snares. Unfortunately, in the last decade, we have had only two confirmations of living solar. And even the number of verified hunted animals has very steeply declined. The picture on the right hand side is a big picture compared with many other species. It's quite clear that solar are now extremely rare. And in compilations to many authors love animal forest mammals, solar are extremely sensitive to poaching. For instance, 
I am guessing many of you, you be familiar with pangolins, the middle one, which are heavily spot everywhere in Southeast Asia. But pangolins are actually still relatively easy to detect in the forest. Other such as the similar signs, so rounds, right hand sign, and even at some sites, also critically endangered love and the on the left hand side. From all of these evidence, we unfortunately believe that it is very likely they are fewer than 100 solar left. The question I'm sure on most people's mind is, why haven't we been fighting so long? Why was 2013 the last time we got evidence of solar alive in the forest? Much of the reason is simply due to the fact that solar are now extremely rare and surveys have only touched a small minorities of potential solar lens. We can find solar by luck. We have to search intensively for them. Prof will talk more to you about this during his talk. Our problem is solar populations really are, really are no longer populations. In most cases, they are likely to be single individual solar. So if the assumption is that most solar would be missed, even if there were still healthy population of solar present, it is not at all surprising that most of the time in areas where they have been surveyed for solar, we haven't actually found them. But to expand this more, we will look at some specific example from some of the recent survey work that's been carried out. So let's take a look at the map. So you can get a sense of where some of the survey sites are. One of the sites I will be talking about is Kunse Nongma National Protected Area. That's the area within small yellow circle in the middle of the map. Another important area to get yourself familiar with is Barikamsai province. That is the part of solar land within the blue circle. Rob and I have been working in these two areas for a number of years in collaborative effort with several organizations, especially solar working group, you probably know, uh, Wildlife Conservation Society, Asian Arts, Laos Wildlife Conservation Association, and Integrated Conservation of Biodiversity and Forest Project. As you can see, Laos Solar Lens expands six provinces, and each different color on the map. I will just point out you to Wu Kuang National Park. That's where solar were first discovered in early 1990. And that gray dot in the south of solar lens, that's the location in Vietnam of the last record we have of 
Uppsala in 2013. Everyone, try to remember the size I have mentioned here. I have a little bit problem. Um, I cannot move my slide. Can you press your space bar? <laughs> yeah, yeah, thanks. Yeah. So, got it. Okay. Um, Rob and I have been coordinating with our working group. Lead efforts to detect solar and trails method at the site since 2017. As you can see, there's been what seems like a huge amount of camera tapping focused in a relatively small area. But even after more than three years of camera tapping, we still have not detected on the camera taps any gap. Now, gauss is very large species of wise oxen. As hopefully you can see from the picture. But we know gauss are present. We have found footprints and one even walked onto a road where this photo was taken from just a mobile phone. But none have been captured by any of camera tap. It is a similar story for Mobile Cat and Crisis Agus. On the bottom, species rarely detected on camera tap, but detected in other ways. Knowing all of this, it is reasonable to think that they are still solar prison. After all the sign, still has cows and bears. So basically it's very vulnerable in realized period and ones which for hunters will not be hard to detect. The critically endangered laugh element jacks, animized you rub it, and penguins, showing on the slide, are still certainly common. The same vulnerable Sambadia is still fairly good population. Now to move on to another areas, Borikam Sai Spovin. In Borikam Sai's province, Love and I have been working with uh, Saolau Working Group and other partners, especially Wildlife Conservation Society, on a somewhat different approach, focused on exploring and using local indigenous knowledge in the search for solar. Where the last verified evidence of solar came from in Laos in 2010, Working with WCS there has been ongoing investigation of solar status in Phu since 2010. And every year, local communities members and Phu patrol teams members still report solar sightings and all observation of solar sites in and around Phu What we have been finding is individual people's knowledge of solar is quite variable and there are often quite significant difference of opinion between people. For instance, one person will tell us that solar is certainly plants in a certain way. And another person during another discussion will tell us a different story version of solar feeding. Only a few months ago, 
we all got excited when one of Blanchett's team in Pussy Tone collect this down on the top left hand side because it looks so much like in real solar dung, the top on the right hand side. This being dung collected in 1999 from captive solar, but it turned out to be so raw. So what does all this mean? Is it important to remember that solar are not likely, are not like elephants or tigers, which have unmistakable size, which are next to impossible to miss. Solar size, at least with current knowledge, are cryptic. And knowing next to nothing about solar ecologies, we cannot be confident predict where to look. And as I have explained, if solar are as extremely rare as we believe, and these remaining animals are scheduled to trot out the full length of potential habitat. As a reminder, in area equivalent to defend arts or the state of New Jersey, then the lack of evidence since 2013 is hardly surprising. How US authors pushing has been devastating for many species, not just solar. There are pockets of forest where pushing intensity has been lower and in this pocket, animals communities are much healthier. Many other species targeted by poachers still persist. For instance, cow, bears, and penguins. And an even greater reason to be positive is, to our knowledge, solar in general has not been a primary target of hunting, especially in the last decade. So any remaining solar are not actively being searched for by poachers. All of this combined makes it highly likely that small number of solar are still left capture too that was animized for its length. To some, we believe that's all things considered. And despite what seems like a long and intensive history for searching, that with such a small remaining population of solar, the past effort and our level of knowledge probably amounts to less than 10% of what needed to reliable detect solar. You will learn more about this in Rob talk. Um, there are no questions what we face an extreme silence to fill the gap and finally some of those solar. And that's where I will leave off. And my college love view continues to enlighten us after a short time for questions. That's all my presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. Thanks, Olay. <laughs> um, I wanted to ask, are you able to turn your video on for the Q&A? Uh, there we go. Hi. <laughs> Good to see you. Um, we have four questions that came in. Um, oh, make that five. Uh, first question is from Roberto. Um, he asks, has anyone seen a Saula in person recently or taken a photo of them with a camera other than a camera trap? Um, Ole, we can't hear you. Hold on one second. Yep. Oh, there we go. No, no, no. No bio biologists have seen Saula in the wild. Okay, um, another question from Jonathan. Um, is this, are the snares intentionally there to catch Saola or other species as well? And is there any solution to minimize the snare problems? Yes, snare also affect to many species, um, living cow species actually. 
um, the way to 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 this just to reduce the snare by building lanyard teams, as we did in Kunse uh, Nongma. Okay. Um, next question from Joaquin. Um, have there been any reports on Saula found um, in black wildlife markets or other wildlife markets? No, never. Just only uh, in, in the Lulo's um, village, you know, the horn attached uh, on the hunter house but no any evidence files uh, in the market. Okay. Um, do local people know the Sala or do you have to show them a picture? It depends on um, some areas in Borikam size where it's, um, knowledge is very strong, local knowledge, uh, local people, sorry, lo local people will know well about Sala. Um, okay. Um, another question from Roberto. Why um, why have just 10% of the effort and knowledge been invested in detecting Salva so far? Good question. Uh, you will see and listen what Rob going to say in the next talk. <laughs> okay, <laughs> good answer. Um, have there been Salva feces found in the wild? If the saolo was getting the wrong diet when it was in captivity, it might it look different? Sorry, could you repeat your question again? Um, have they found saolo feces in the wild? And if they if the saolo was getting the wrong diet when it was in captivity, would the feces look different? In captivity um, than in the wild? Would the dung look different? Mm -hmm. oh, okay. Um, yes, uh, it's very hard uh, to identify solar size, even down. As, as I mentioned at the beginning, no one have really observed solar in the wild. And we don't know, we're not sure what the solar dung look like. Okay. Um, okay, I think this is the last question. Um, is it possible that habitats have been missed in the camera trap locations? Um, could Saula be occupying habitats that not anticipated that we don't know about? Yes. Yes, as I mentioned um, in the slide earlier, camera trapping is not based method to detect animals. It's highly animal uh, will be missed, you know, setting the cameras, you know, at the at the locations. Okay, thank you very much, Ole. Um, You're welcome. We are now going to hand things over to Rob. Um, Rob, go ahead and turn your speaker on. Hey, hello, everybody. Um, Sorry, I, sh I should be a little bit more set up here. Um, I'm trying to see where my uh, my screen has gone, uh, which I thought I had up. Um, sorry for the <laughs> sorry for the technical difficulty here. Uh, hold on a second. Um, Man, we expect to find Saula. I can't find his screen. I'm, this is worrisome. yes. I, I know. I'm, <laughs> the last time, the last time I did this, it was it just kind of popped up, and this time, of course, it's not popping up. Let me. Uh, here it is. Here. Ah, uh, okay. I found it now. How's that for everybody? Looking good. Is that looking good? Yeah. Okay, sorry for that hiccup, everybody. Um, hello. Um, so yeah, as um, kind of Ole explained, um, I'm going to try and walk you through today kind of our our thoughts and our kind of strategy that we've been developing as to 
you know, how we're going to overcome that kind of challenge that um, Oliver was talking about. Yeah, and how we're going to essentially find Sala um, so that it can be saved. Oops. Oh dear. <laughs> now wait a bit. I just have to figure out how to advance my slide. There we are. Um, yes, yeah, I think hopefully um, Ole kind of explains very well. Um, you know, we've got a, a serious challenge here. Um, you know, I think for many people, it can be surprising that um, you know the last, the last confirmed evidence, you know, the last verified evidence we've got of Sowler, unrefutable evidence, was back in 2013 from a camera trap photo in in Vietnam. Um, but as you know, as, as Ole kind of explained, you know, we, we um, you know, there's, there's good reasons there. And, you know, one of those reasons is that, unfortunately, now we believe that there's so few solar left. Um, and as, Ale, as uh, Ole hopefully uh, got you all to understand, you know, maybe on a map, it looks like a relatively small area. But, you know, when you're there in the forest, we're talking about a huge area. Um, you know, spread, it's about probably three, about 300 miles, about 500 kilometers, the length of the Anamite throughout which um, uh, remaining solar range is scattered. Um, the methods we've been using are not really well adapted to finding uh, extremely rare species like that, you know, methods are generally developed for detecting populations of animals where it doesn't really matter if you don't detect most of the individuals in that population. You only need to detect a few. Um, in the case of Saula, where we're just looking for single animals, it's rather a different um, ball game. Um, and yeah, and as also, you know, Ole pointed out, you know, Saula is not like some of these other very charismatic species, which we know a lot about, and um, which often, you know, is, is sort of, there's no other confusion for them. Um, it's easy to go into the forest and look for an elephant or a tiger. Saula, you know, it's very similar to a number of other ungulates. So it's, it's a, you know, it's a challenge. It will always be a challenge to, to distinguish uh, Saula signs, say, from, from Surau. You know, it will probably always be a specialist who needs to kind of make those judgments. Um, and so, yeah, as, as kind of Ole was was saying, you know, when you, when you kind of put everything together, you know, and when you consider we, we, we're looking for, you know, fewer than probably 100 individuals, that, that kind of level of effort that's gone in so far, compared with kind of what we need, you know, now, as we, as we kind of talk now, is, is probably less than about 10% of what's really needed to sort of give us confidence in, in detecting solar and therefore saving Sala. Um, but as far as we're concerned, there's a great deal of hope. Um, you know, hopefully as Ole convince you that, um, you know, we're confident that there are still Sala right there. Um, we, you know, absolutely don't believe that Sala could be extinct yet. Um, we, you know, we understand this challenge that we have, you know, we understand why, why Sala are rare. Um, and as far as we're concerned, there's no real practical, you know, logistic reason why we can't um, find Saula. It's it's really just a you know a question of how how to go about it. And of course, you know, to save Saula, you've got to believe it, and we really do believe we can do it. So um, you know, in, in the Saula Foundation, we've really been uh, considering one question because really we we don't want to just find Saula. we've got to find Saula, um you know in a way that we can save Saula. so this is our central question that we've been considering you know can Saula be detected in a way that allows safe and viable capture for the conservation breeding through the IUCN one plan approach um so <clears throat> You know, so this is the question. So this is the this is the and the strategy that we're kind of approaching based on that question. And the you know, based on that, this fact that you know we've we've maybe only got less than ten percent of the way there at the moment. The one thing that we've really got to do is get better and faster. 
you know, we, we can't be detecting solar once every 10 years. You can't save solar uh, that way. Um, you know, we can't, we, this can't be a question of luck, you know, it's, it's got to be a question of certainty and reliability in detecting all of those solar individuals. Um, and of course, if we can develop, you know, sort of these viable methods and have certainty and reliability in detecting solar, then we can start to determine and be sure, you know, of, of, safely, cap of safely capturing solar. Um, so this is just kind of a graphic to kind of show you. I mean, as pointed out, you know, we sort of really down at the bottom of the graph there. But the thing to, to think about here is that we don't believe it's, you know, kind of a straight line graph. What we believe is that, you know, with, with increased effort, you know, we get increased knowledge. And very rapidly, we should be able to, you know, curve that. That curve should be able to curve upwards to give us that certainty and reliability in detecting solar. And a lot of that will come, come from the fact that, you know, every time we learn something, every time we detect a solar, we have to, we have to really capitalize on those um, detections and really learn as much as we can, as rapidly as we can. And if we can do that, then yeah, we can go from 10%, hopefully, you know, 50%, 60%, 90%, 100% relatively rapidly. Um, one of the crucial aspects to, to sort of moving us forwards, you know, along that graph is that we've got to be able to, um, you know, verify solar presence in real time. So one of the real predicaments we have at the moment is that, for instance, uh, on the left there, you've got a, the, a camera trap photo of a solar. You know, when we when we get an image like that, you, you know, it's 100% sure certainty that it's a solar. Unfortunately, you know, you you go into the forest, you set a camera. It might be a month later. It might be three months later that you come back, collect that camera, and then start to look at the photos. A month later, three months later, that solar is no longer obviously necessarily where that camera was. We don't, you know, you don't know any, you know, where that solar has moved to, and so it makes kind of follow up and and kind of gaining knowledge about that solar that was there difficult, you know. It's unlikely you can go back to where that camera was and find the signs because signs in forest, uh, you know, particularly tropical forest, wet forest, they deteriorate very quickly. You know, footprints might only last a couple of days. You know, dung can can rapidly with with uh, fungi and insects and everything can disappear. You know, also within days. Um, so you know, there's a there's a big impediment to learning quickly. And the other problem we have, as kind of uh, Ole also kind of spoke to you about, is that you know when we when we're looking for solar signs, the problem there is yes, we can find signs and they might be fresh, but our problem is, do we know you know is it a solar? Can we be certain it's a solar? And at, at present, we just can't. You know that um, we know there's a great deal of similarity between solar and some of these other species. And we're not certain, you know, about what what characterizes solar from some of these other species. Um, the local knowledge, as much as we would like to use it, is is somewhat confusing, and so it's hard to know, you know, who to, who to trust. Um, so again, again with um, with signs, again we can, you know, as Ollie alluded to, you know, we've been collecting, for example, dung samples. But the problem again there is that you collect a sample, you have to take it out of the forest, send it to a lab somewhere, they do genetic analysis. Again, you're usually looking at a turnaround time of a month at least. So once again, you know, by the time if it were a solar, the solar is potentially long gone. So we, you know, we've really got to um, find a way to, um, to, you know, be able to verify solar in real time. Um, what it really, you know, in, in terms of what we really need to do and, and sort of the, um, the, the, the crucial thing is that really we've got to maximize our, our chances of, you know, coming across where a solar has been in the forest. And we've got to recognize it. You know, you can, you can walk through the forest and 
many times you may cross paths with a seller and just not notice it, you know, signs aren't always that obvious. Um, but we believe that, you know, recognizing and understanding seller signs is really key, key to moving us forward with the knowledge and understanding that we need, um, you know, to, to sort of answer that question and give us certainty. Um, you know, what, what, what we really need is one of these things. You know, if, if we were working in North America, great, you know, there's books, you know, many books kind of, you know, on uh, mammal tracks and science. It'd be relatively easy to do these things here. We just don't have that yet for uh, the Animites. And this is essentially what we need to do. We've got to develop this book from scratch. Um, so yeah, how are we going to do that? You know, as I said, you know, it's it's really down to developing this knowledge about solar signs. Um, it's going to be a question of you know taking the best of the methods out there, integrating them, um, and and you know, and and learning from them as best we can. Um, we believe you know to do this, it's a question really of building a you know world class detection team. Um, obviously, focusing efforts where we really believe this salva to be, but given this, given this um, um, likely fact that you know we're only ten percent of the way there now, it's really going to be about an intensive, you know, unprecedented effort. Um, so the you know the the. We've, in terms of our strategy, you know, we've we've kind of broken it down into several components, and probably the the most essential and the sort of core component of our strategy is going to be, um, you know, developing a world class um, uh, animal tracking team. Now, um, you know, maybe people familiar with North America, you know. You have these very specialized specialist uh, trackers in North America. You know these skills have been uh, well developed. You know, as I said, there's essentially books written on 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 this practice here. Um, and so, what we need to what we need to do is kind of build the you know try and find and build this expertise up. Now we're hoping, you know, to recruit and find people uh you know within the indigenous communities in um in lao who already have these you know kind of gifts of observation um and i think you know we're also looking to to you know to to if possible kind of recruit a a, a younger generation of, of people and what we want to try and do is pair those with these international experts. As I say, you know, particularly in, in North America, but also uh, very much so in Africa, you know, these, these, these tracking skills are, are well understood and have been well developed. Um, and so what we're considering is partnering, you know, with some international organizations. We've been talking to this one, uh, cyber track, this cyber trackers, which is kind of a network of of African-based uh, wildlife trackers um, and integrating both the sort of international and local uh, talent together uh, to create this, you know, um, very, very specialized animal tracking team. Um, so that, 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 as I mentioned, is probably you know, kind of the first and most essential components. Um, the second, component which actually is also really crucial as i said you know we we've really got to um we've we've really got to um be able to move forward in, in our ability to verify solar as quickly as possible so um equipment actually already exists to do dna testing in the field um and it's you know it's basically handheld equipment that you can easily carry into the field, battery operated, um, and so we have been partnering with Wildlife Conservation Society. They have a molecular laboratory in New York, um, and we're working with them to to develop this this uh, kit. Now this 
you know, it, we don't have to do, develop this all from scratch. This is kind of a tried and tested uh, um, method and has been kind of, you know, WCS have been kind of helping develop this with projects around the world. They haven't quite done it, you know, specifically in, in exactly the same context as we need it for Saula. Um, so it's really just a question of kind of tweaking, tweaking kind of extraction protocols uh, and, and things like that um, to, 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 to get it, um, you know, just designed for Saula. Um, and the good news is that, you know, talking with them, we believe we can uh, have this ready essentially by the end of this year, um, at the latest early next year. So, you know, hopefully by the beginning of next year, we can be carrying this kit, uh, teams can be carrying this kit in the field, uh, you know, refining solar signs and testing them there and then. Um, you, and you actually get an, a result back basically, you know, within a couple of hours. So it, it, it's not a, it's not a, um, um, you know, it, it, the, 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 the most amazing thing about this really is that, you know, by taking this into the field, we potentially have the possibility to, you know, to learn more in maybe a day or, or a couple of days about solar science, about solar ecology, than we've managed to learn in essentially the 30 years since solar has, uh, you know, been known. And so this potentially is going to be a real game changer in, in kind of moving us forward along that, along that curve. Um, looking, looking, you know, a little far further ahead, um, another crucial component that we believe will be part of our, this search strategy will be um, developing a detection dog team. Um, now these are, you, many of you may have heard about these detection dogs, they're used, um, you know, they're now actually widely used throughout the world. Maybe you've seen them um, most commonly. So, so you know, I, I, I've noticed in recent years, kind of if I'm flying back into the US, there'll sometimes be a, a, a you know, um, a customs agent with a dog kind of going around sniffing people's luggage. So this is essentially the same, the same idea. Um, you know, dogs, dogs' noses tend to be better than human eyes at, at uh, detecting things. And that's not that's not hard to understand. You know, if you're in the forest, the undergrowth is dense. You know, you even even if you're you know really talented, as I say, gifted uh, animal tracker, there's kind of limitations to how far you can see. You know, none of us have X-ray vision, for instance. Um, well, as you know, dogs rely on their olfactory abilities, and that tends to tends to work a little bit better than than vision at kind of detecting things like cryptic, uh, you know, somewhat cryptic uh, uh, animal signs. Um, and again, to do this, you know, we want to invest in the long term, so we kind of want to develop basically a low team, which again will kind of involve working with. Uh, you know, international expertise and pairing that with the right type of recruits in Laos and sort of building that capacity um, so that we can essentially have a standalone team. Um, and again, you know, several partners in Laos are very interested in working with us with that, particularly uh, Free the Bears uh, and Asian Ox. Yeah, so, so just to, to remind you, so, you know, all of this is really about just pushing us as quickly and as, as rapidly along that curve. And, you know, we've got a lot of confidence that, you know, even though we may be, you know, it, it, it seems like at the moment we have an almost impossible task, moving, moving forward to, to a state where we are feeling uh, certain and reliable shouldn't be, shouldn't be uh, that difficult. It will be intensive, it will take effort, but it shouldn't be, you know, it's nowhere near impossible. Um, so, so we've mentioned uh, a little bit about the methods. Ole, you know, has, has talked to you a little bit through about, um, you know, kind of solar range. And so I just wanted to briefly um, talk about where we're likely to focus. Um, as Ole mentioned, 
we've worked a lot in Bolicampsoe province and that's where we we're initially uh, going to uh, start this intensive search effort. Uh, there's several reasons for that, but um, primarily that's where, um, particularly from a Lao context, there's a great, uh, you know, a wider uh, level of knowledge uh, of solar knowledge in Bolicampsoe and the and communities there tend to appear to have kind of a deeper level of knowledge of Saula. Um, and so, you know, in terms of building, pairing that kind of international and local expertise together, that's where we believe that, you know, we can do that best. And it's also, I think, as Ole mentioned, you know, we've got a lot of good existing partner relationships there, you know, with NGOs, with the government, um, and also these indigenous, indigenous communities. Um, and from the survey work we've already done there, we've, we've also got a reasonably good idea, you know, of where, where we believe we're most likely to uh, find Saula in those landscapes. So, yeah, uh, to, to start to sum up, I mean, what we, what we need, you know, is basically an intensive, very unprecedented level of effort. I think um, for, for those of you more familiar with conservation, I think there can be this sense in conservation that, you know, you make do with what you can, that, um, you know, sort of anything's better than nothing, but we, we, we can't really let ourselves um, believe that, you know, that's the case with this. You know, what, 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 we, what we're trying to do has to be unprecedented. You know, we've got to be cutting edge. We've got to aim to to do, you know, have a world class effort. Um, and so, you know, um, but as long as as long as we can, you know, aim high and and keep that bar high, then then our chances, I believe, of of being successful are great. Um, and through that, you know, we we essentially start to put in place place the beginnings of you know a successful future uh solar conservation one plan approach um so just to just to there now uh, kind of um talk a little bit about how we see all this happening so we believe um that we're looking really at a at a essentially a two-year very intensive uh, solar search program. And so we've been thinking of this really in, in three phases. Um, the first phase was the, essentially, you know, the launch of the Solar Foundation, um, you know, the fundraising that's been ongoing. And of course that will continue. Um, the second phase, which we're kind of, which we're starting to really enter now is this sort of uh, preparation phase. And as I mentioned, we, we've been uh, thinking really about that in, in three, uh, sorry, four main components. Uh, the first of which is really developing this core team and uh, developing the, the tracking expertise. Um, the second component, again, which we hope to start, you know, very soon is developing this detection dog team, because, you know, as soon as we can have all of these things together, the better. Um, as I mentioned, the, you know, we've already started along the path of this uh, DNA test kit, and hopefully we can get, that'll be finished um, and in the field early next year. Um, and then there's another uh, component to this that we haven't, uh, that I haven't talked about yet, but that, um, you know, to, to be able to have this intensive search program in Laos, uh, Saula Foundation needs to work with the uh, Lao government on a memorandum of understanding. You know, this is essentially kind of the, the legal document with the Lao government that will allow us to, to conduct that intensive search program. And then the third phase, which hopefully, you know, we can start uh, as soon as possible. I mean, the really starting the first phase Will, will depend mainly on, on developing the uh, core field team and this and starting to bring together this solar tracking expertise. 
but really once we've we've got that together then we can re, you know, then we you know we can start to implement and get into the field and start um you know learning about solar science trying you know trying to cross paths with the solar uh you know recognizing it and, and rapidly as fast as we can um learning as much as we can and starting to get confident in, in our ability so yeah that, that's that's how uh, we're looking at the strategy um i just wanted to to mention a little bit about um you know as, as much as this is about you know saving solar it's not without benefits for for other other species and for the Annamite Mountains as well, you know. Hopefully saving solar is just the start of a, of a very long um, path, you know, to, to helping conserve the so many other threatened species in the Annamites. And, you know, one of those pieces is obviously, you know, by developing the all the expertise, the core team, sort of building up national, um, national capacity, you know, in, in with detection dogs and handlers and trackers this all helps in the future for many other species um and the, you know the whole process itself hopefully will be you know the foundation for similar programs for other species um we hope of course you know that this has you know in, in terms of raising awareness and capacity that that's you know goes well beyond just the solar foundation team as well and so um you know hopefully you know through this there are so many so many added benefits and you know and above all hopefully this you know by saving solar we just we you know we 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 create that that sort of inspiration that's in some ways in some ways is a little bit lacking you know when you when you look at southeast asia it can seem very depressing you know the stories about uh you know the the levels of snaring you know the fact that solar are so close to extinction so if we can turn that around hopefully this will be the start of you know that sort of inspiration needed to turn it around for the animites as a whole so with that, um, I will uh, say thank you. And yeah, and you know, we can't do this alone. So hopefully you'll continue to uh, help us and spread the message. And you know, sooner than later, we will have we'll have one of those baby Sowler you know, as, as pictured on the on the left there. Um, that's you know, that's what we're all hoping for. And I hope I can see that, you know, within the next few decades. Thank you very much. Thanks, Rob. Um, so before we get to questions, um, I believe that Lorraine and Bill are going to say a couple words. Okay, uh, so yeah, Rob, Thank you very much. That was fantastic. And I, I just think a key point is the added benefit to the Annamite Mountains, which is such an important area for lots of other threatened and highly endangered species besides Sawa. So this isn't just going to be about Sawa. It's going to be about benefiting the Annamites, Annamites as well. So we are about to embark on probably, I mean, one of the most, one of the greatest in terms of importance and intense searches for any wild animal in our time that I can think of, um, you know, on the scale of trying to find the ivory-billed woodpecker in the United States. And we can't do it alone. So we'd be very, very grateful for your help. Um, we've, got, we've got the belief this can get done. We've assembled, I think, one of the best teams in the world to do this. We've got the right people, but we can't do it alone. And we do need your help. And I'm going to turn it over to our CEO, Lorraine, to just give you uh, some suggestions of how you can be involved. And thank you all very much for joining us today. Thanks, Bill. Um, thank you, Oli. Thank you, Rob. Um, I just have to say I'm so proud to be, I'm so proud of our team. Um, it's an honor 
to work with such amazing, passionate and talented people. So uh, this has been a wonderful journey for me and I very much hope it's a long journey. Um, so I hope that from these talks today and from what uh, Rob and Oli have shared with you, they've convinced you that we've, uh, that we've got the talent, the capacity, we understand the scale of the problem that we're facing and what's required to solve it. So resources are the current limiting factor uh, to mobilizing the search effort required to find Saula and to save Saula. Um, I'm just gonna quickly share my screen for a second. Rob, can you stop your screen sharing? I, oh, sorry, I thought. Uh... I think you had already. Yeah, we're good. Oh, there we go. Okay. So I wanted to just take a second to acknowledge our um, our founding donors. So a number of people uh, and organizations all contributed to our, our cause when we launched publicly last year. Um, in addition to this, in addition to our founding donors that you can see here in this uh, graphic, we have had other, you know, very generous donations, Synchronous to Earth, Rocklaw Zoo, Opal Zoo, for example, Boise, Zoo Boise. And um, there's many other individuals, some of who I see are in our audience today that have supported us and believed in our cause. So we're extremely grateful. Um, Corey's gonna put a link to the annual report in the chat box, um, which you can have a look to see um, you know, more details on for, for 2020 on uh, the support that we received so generously. Um, at this point in time, uh, we're very close to securing a large grant from the Critical Ecosystems Partnership Fund, um, almost the full amount they can offer, so uh, 237,000, which is gonna go towards those critical preparatory components that, um, that Rob was talking about there, right? We've got this DNA kit that we're gonna, that we're extremely excited about. It's gonna be a game changer. The detection dogs uh, and, uh, and and then navigating that process of obtaining a legal status in life. So we've got a route, we're hoping for a, a, a very, very good boost on that with the CPF grant that we're, we're almost close to securing. Um, in order to support those pre preparatory components where we've got a target, a near term target of another 130,000. So it's very much within our reach in order to get all those preparatory components ready in order uh, to mobilize um, and uh, and then launch into this uh, intensive search effort, which, which Rob's talked about. Um, so I would appeal to those people that have the means um, to consider supporting us. Um, Corey again, I think, is going to put a, a link to the donations in the um, in the uh, in the chat box or donation screen. Um, and uh, even those small donations, you know, every every little bit helps. And you know, when we get a donation of ten dollars, twenty dollars, it means we know that people are listening to us, right? And that our story is reaching people. So. Um, now we have much larger aspirations, as Rob has been talking about. We really need to. We need to close that 90%, right? So we have a long-term fundraising goal of 2.75 uh, uh, million. It's not gonna be easy, um, but then uh, we knew that, and but, but none of us, I think has been said several times on this talk, none of us would be doing this if we didn't believe it were possible to save Saula. There are many ways to contribute. Um, uh, you could uh, financially consider a fundraiser for Saola. If anybody's interested in running their own fundraiser, please get in touch. We'll support you in any way we can. Um, you might have connections to individuals, organizations who you feel might be a good fit to support a cause like this. If you do, please get in touch. Um, thank you, everybody, um, from the bottom of my heart for, for, for joining us and to my team uh, for uh, such an incredible session. I'm going to hand back to Corey for the remaining Q and A, and then we can keep going on a bit. I think, as Corey mentioned, after the ninety-minute slot. So, feel feel free to leave if you have to. Otherwise, stay in chat. Thanks. All right. Thanks very much, um, Rob. I'm gonna put you back on spotlight so everyone can see you. And um, yeah, we have quite a few questions actually. Um, I apologize if they kind of jump around, but I'm just going to go in the order in which they came in. Um, first one is from Jane about DNA testing. How expensive is the DNA testing? 
So the it's not so expensive. It's it's so one test is essentially less than two hundred dollars per test. Okay. But it, well, okay, okay. So it, it depends a little bit on on um, uh, kind of what you mean. So so the testing that's being done at the moment, the lab based testing, is about two hundred dollars per test. The 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 machine and everything that um, you know we we're working with WCS that's quite expensive, but then but the actual tests that that machine does kind of work out at I think about thirty dollars per test, but that but you know that that's kind of after the this kind of upfront development and purchase uh, cost the actual equipment. Um, Francesco asks, have you tried to ask um, hunters about sal presence? Uh, yeah, so I mean, we spent we spent a lot of time talking to to, you know, uh, local hunters. Um, and, you know, even though we believe, you know, some 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 of the people out there probably know very well about sal it's hard to know who you know who those people are um, because many people will tell you that they they know about solar that they know about solar signs but the trouble is if you compare you know 10 people's 10 people's not knowledge or 10 people's you know what they say solar signs look like there's invariably conflict between between those people so one pe person will say you know maybe the the ends of the solar footprints are kind of rounded and then another person will say the ends of the solar footprints are pointed um so so at the, at the stage we're at now it, it's it's very difficult to be you know sure who to believe um obviously you know we, we want to sort of um learn as much as we can and that's part of the reason why we want to involve this sort of international expertise of these trackers you know, even though they've maybe never been to forest in Southeast Asia, they've developed these skis, the skills to kind of understand, you know, how to think about science. So hopefully bring that together. Um, think, you know, what we know about the little bit we know about Saula from these Saula that have come into captivity and things, you know, we're going to try and piece all that together. Um, OK, a couple questions about um... <clears throat> cameras. Um, would it be possible to install live cameras like the ones used by BBC Earth? And um, have you looked into direct transmission of photos from camera traps to a receiver at a home base? Is that too costly? Uh, it, it, so it, it's it's partly, I'd say that the, the, the biggest challenge is, is the connectivity. So it's hard to get, I mean, it would have to be a satellite connection. And I think, uh, and as I understand it, I mean, and even satellite connections are not not that reliable in in the sort of dense forests where where we're talking about. And then, then yeah, it's it's kind of the question of cost as well, because I mean, it, you know, as we mentioned, we've had three hundred cameras um, for three years in Kunzagnamar, and we haven't had one picture of a sowler. Uh, we've, we, you know, we've got. Basically, a million, a million photographs from that, that three years, but none of them are of Saula. And as, as Ollie pointed out, we also we know Gower are there, and we've never had those on the cameras either. Um, you know, we had um, we've detected marble cat once, so basically one in a million. Um, so it potentially gets incredibly costly to to for that to be a way to have any confidence that we would actually see it. You know. See you, um, okay, from Roberto, do all the efforts of the Saula Foundation take place in Laos or do you operate in Vietnam as well? Um, do you collaborate with Vietnamese organizations and or authorities? Uh, so, yeah, I mean, in terms of the field work that we, the, this, this intensive search effort, we're thinking about that solely in terms of Laos. Um, I mean, what, what, one of the reasons there is that just, you know, trying to operate an intensive search in two countries would be incredibly challenging. It's, you know, challenging, challenging enough in one country. So um, for various reasons, we believe Laos is the best place, place to do that work. I mean, in terms of the, 
in terms of you know everything else it's a very collaborative effort so you know Sala Foundation is very closely tied to the Sala Working Group. You know, myself, Ole, uh, Lorraine are all uh, Sala Working Group members, um, you know, very active in the Sala Working Group. Um, we have, you know, there are very active Sala Working Group members in, in Vietnam as well. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, there's, there's continual kind of collaboration going on in terms of, the you know, that Particularly, you know, kind of thinking about this, the, the IUCN one plan approach, as, as Bill mentioned, you know, this, this kind of overall uh, strategy to save Saula, you know, it, it, it's basically a collaborative effort across both, both countries. Okay, um, Jane asks, in view of past failures to keep uh, captured Saula alive, what would you do to keep one alive? Um, I mean, that's not my expertise, and the Sala Working Group has a whole, um, you know, kind of body of ex situ people. And as far as I understand it, um, I mean, I mean, part, part of the reason why why no Sala survived in the past is that they've never been they've never been housed in 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 um, in um, in, you know, in good enough uh, environment, none of them have been housed in an appropriate facility where there's been vets available, people who kind of understand animal husbandry. You know, every sowler so far that's been captured and brought into captivity has just been kept in a pen somewhere that was just, um, you know, not purpose built, wasn't even built to really keep ungulates. Um, most of them have been fed um, you know, on natural diets, I believe, you know, several of them were just fed, fed rice because, you know, people thought, well, everything eats rice, so why wouldn't a salary eat rice? Um, so it, it's not, that, you know, there's no real comparison to be made with what's happened to previous uh, captive salary to what would, would, you know, should be possible with, you know, a state-of-the-art uh, uh, conservation breeding facility. Um, okay, Ask, excuse me, Ashley asks, uh, Rob, are you currently working on developing an Anamites trail guide for the species out there? With your expertise, it's hard to imagine a better qualified expert to take on that task. Um, I, I'm not sure I understand what's meant by trail guide. About, if we're talking about kind of a, you know, like, like a tracks and, and tracks and signs book, um, maybe. <laughs> Maybe if I ever get some free time. I'm not sure I'm ever going to get any free time though, but let's see. Okay. Um, if we compare how much we know about a common animal, like a cow, for example, uh, versus a saula, what percentage of information do we know about it? For example, reproduction, behavior, diet, etc. cetera. Oh, probably less than 1%. Wow. <laughs> Okay. Um, I think Linda's question about um, dog tracking was answered, uh, but Vibe asks, how about a combination of using tracking dogs with infrared drones above the canopy? Um, I, I don't know enough about infrared drones. I mean, I, I, the last time, I mean, I have, we haven't looked into it closely. Um, with, with with all of the with all of these things, the, the question would be how how recognizable would the image be? You know, can you? And the other thing to remember is these are these are very dense canopies. Um, I don't know how well. I mean, I, 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 I you know I think it was some years ago that I would had some discussions about this, and at that time the technology, you know, there was just no way you could rec rec you know do species level recognition of animals under a canopy. Um, the, the other thing, if you want, if we want to get technical, is 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 the question of detection probability. Um, you know, no method is a hundred percent reliable. You know, but basically a hundred percent efficient at detecting animals. It, it's, it's always some percentage below ninety percent, um, and therefore it, it's kind of the the the. The kind of if you think about a drone flying over a forest, it's kind of the strip width that, that you'd have that detection. And so, you know, I, I 
it's probably also a question of logistics. You know, you might have to fly, say, 200,000 hours or something, you know, to even stand a chance of getting a solar detection. Um, you know, there's, there's all these kind of technical issues. I mean, it, it's certainly something to think about in the future, but um, let, let's see where things go. Um, Lorraine, did you want to weigh in on that one? Just a, just a little bit. Um, no, I, I was. it made me think. Uh, I'd heard that there was a university in the States somewhere. It's escaped my memory which university that are trial, trialing this drone technique in, in forests in Mondokiri, I believe, in Cambodia. But this is for primates that are up at the top of the canopy. Um, it'll still be interesting to see what those results come back as. It's, it, it's, I'm unsure as to what would happen with animals that are, you know, on the forest floor. I think Rob gave a pretty comprehensive answer there, so... <laughs> Thanks. Okay, sure. Um, okay, and um, we got a lot of actually very thoughtful comments as well that I'm not I'm not going to go too in depth on, but um, we're going to save the chat um, for you, Rob. So if you want to discuss any of this either after the Q and A um, or privately with people, that um, we'll send those along. But there are a couple more that came in towards the end. Um, Jane was asking, how many live Sala have you and Ole seen? Um, and how long has it been since there was one in captivity? Uh, I, I've only ever seen one live Sala, and that was the, the Sala that um, actually Bill, Bill also saw back in uh, 1996, uh, affectionately named Martha. So she she came into um, captivity in a in a small kind of private menage menagerie in Laxau, and Bill and myself and various other people had the um, yeah the the privilege to to see her. Unfortunately, she only lived about a month. Um, that's the only salary I've ever seen. And but I'm very hopeful I'm going to see some more in the future. <laughs> do you want do you want to give a later answer that for himself or? No. <laughs> <laughs> Are you you're good, Ole? Yeah, I'm right. good. Um, I never seen live Saula in my life, but I hope to see in the near future. Yeah, and sure. so, so so the last time, I mean, yeah, I mean, it's hard to know in terms of local communities. I mean, we, you know, maybe somebody saw one last year. It, it's very difficult to 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 know. We we do get. Um, you know, we still are getting reports from local communities. Um, in terms of, you know, verified sightings, the last time, you know, we can 100% be sure somebody saw a Saula was back in uh, 2010. Okay, um, Bill asks, rather than try to um, captively breed caught animals, would it be more productive to radio collar captured animals to more fully collect information on their movements and natural history? Um, I mean, so, so part, you know, part of these questions hopefully are going to get answered when we, you know, after or during this intensive search effort. Um, I, you know, our belief now, as, as, as we've mentioned, is that there's fewer than 100 animals left, um, which, all, which basically means that it's unlikely Sowler are meeting other Sowler. Um, so, you know, in one sense, um, you know, Salra are no longer behaving, uh, you know, naturally. We believe there's, there's, you know, there's no chance of saving Salra in the wild anymore, uh, unfortunately. Um, and as much as it would be great to to collar a Salra, you know, to put a put, to put a radio collar on a Salra, you have to capture it. And capturing a Salra under any circumstance, you know, for any, any animal, right? Ca capturing any animal in the forest is a stressful uh, procedure. It carries dangers, it carries risks. Um, so, you know, all, all, all things all things considered, you know, the, the general consensus right now is that if there's gonna be any attempt to capture Saula, the most sensible thing would be to uh, bring those animals into, uh, into a conservation breeding center. Okay, and uh, we'll call this the last question now uh, from Michael. What is the reason of the low detection rate for the marbled cat and gar? 
Is it because of heavy poaching of these two species or the wrong habitat? Uh, basically poaching again. So we built, yeah, we, we're sure there are still some gower uh, there, as you know, as we pointed out. Um, just like Sowler, we believe the numbers are very low. Um, yeah, I mean, so 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 marble cat is is like Sowler, probably a very sensitive species to to hunting. Um, we've been a little su surprised that we've only detected one one marble cat in in Um but it but it fits a pattern. So yeah, it, it's primarily it's primarily as a result of the hunting pressure. Okay, thanks very much. Um, so before we open this up to more uh, informal chat here, I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording. And then I will invite you all to unmute and we can continue.